and now we move on to making the LFS system bootable. So let's copy this for a start off and then we'll edit it. So we'll start off by modifying the root line. So this is the device that's got the root on it. So to be sure that we're copying the right thing, I'm going to ftis minus l slash def slash nvme 0 n1. And the root file system is this partition here. So let's go back in and paste that in there. So I'll delete that. So that's the root. The file system type is ext4 and we'll accept the defaults. The swap is the same as the above but it's partition number 3 so let's paste that in and change that to 3. And then we've also got two other partitions. We've got partition one, which is the boot. And that's also an ext type four file system. And I'll set that to no auto with defaults. So the no auto tells the system not to mount it automatically. Uh, we don't normally need it on a running system, so there's no point in mounting it. And we just mount it manually whenever we need to access it. I'll set this to dump and I think I'll set that to a two. And the last partition we need to add here is to make the system aware of is the... Um, sorry, I think I've got this the wrong way around, haven't I? This is actually the... The boot is actually P2. So let's insert a line there and put in P1, which is the EFI partition, which is under boot forward slash EFI. So in theory, that should be after this boot line to make a bit more sense. And that's a VFAT file system. And again, we won't load that automatically, but we'll load it with the defaults when we do. Uh, that should be defaults. And we won't dump that one. Or system check it either. So that should be all we need to do there. Um, we'll come back probably and check this when we come to do the um, UEFI set up with Grub. So that's okay for now. So now let's move on to Linux and go back to sources and extract the kernel um, so that we can build it. Now it can be quite challenging to build the kernel. There's hundreds of options now. Um, it says there's 12,000 configuration items. Um, we can use the default config to create a generic configuration and then you can just adjust the configuration um, to customize it for your machine for anything that might not have been picked up. Um, so we'll do that. I have actually got a kernel I've got from a previous Linux from scratch but I'm going to uh, try and do this without using that. Uh, to show that it can be quite straightforward. So let's make MR proper as it says to clear the source tree. And then rather than use make menu config, I'm going to use command make def config. And that will create some defaults based on the architecture, which it's done. And now I'm going to use make menu config. 
And what I'm going to do here is just to check some things that are critical to ensuring that the computer starts up correctly. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, where well, it's not actually critical, but it's probably a good idea to make sure that the processor is a correct one. So it's a Core 2 or newer Xeon is the one I want. So basically any 64-bit uh, Intel CPU that's not an Atom and is not a Pentium 4, um, i.e. any Core 2 is, is that option. So it would be anything probably within the last 10 years or so. Or so. Um, I'm now going to check that the device drivers has got NVMe support because that's the main storage device on here so it's not set so I need to set this by setting yes um, for both uh, that's probably a good one to have and probably multipath as well um, I don't think I need anything else there there's Let's have a look to see what we've got here. Power, plug and play. Serial ATA and parallel ATA. Um, well, there's no parallel ATA on this. So I'll get rid of that and that and that. So that just leaves AHCI SATA. So there's no devices plugged into any SATA ports. Um, but I might want that in the future, so I'm going to leave that as it is uh, in case I do add in hardware in the future. Um, port multiplier support probably don't need, so I'll get rid of that. And that should be enough. So let's look through here now to see if it tells us to install anything else, and it does. So we'll go through each of these options to ensure these things are configured. So we start with general setup and we look for compile the kernel with warnings as errors. So we need to remove that. Then look for CPU task time and stats accounting, which is down the bottom. Go into that and we need to make sure pressure stall information tracking is set. And this option here is unset, so that's fine. Quit that and go to enable kernel headers through syskernel headers tar xz. So that presumably is down here. So it's not set already, so that's okay. We need to next check control group support. That's set. Go into that and make sure the memory control is set as well. So that's okay. Now we go down and look for the configure standard kernel features for expert users. It's not set, so that's okay. Exit that. The next bit we go into is process type and features and build a relocatable kernel. So that's somewhere down here, I think. There it is there. It's already set on. It's forced on by something else. And the KASLR is already set as well, so that's fine. General architecture dependent options, stack protection, overflow, buffer overflow detection set, and strong stack protector is set as well. So that's okay. Go into device drivers and generic driver options, and we remove the support for U event alpha. That's already uh, disabled, so that's fine. Maintain the dev tempfs file system is checked and auto mount is checked as well. Now let's go into the graphic support, which is just a little bit down here. Uh, there it is there, go into that. And we want to make sure that direct rendering, rendering manager is set or set as a module. If DRM is set or built in or set as a module, this must be selected. Enable legacy FDEV support. 
So enable legacy FDEF support for your mode setting driver. That's that one there. So we've set that and then go back up again and go to console display driver support. And if DRM is selected again, we need to set the frame buffer console support, which is already set. So that's okay. And we can optionally add in a logo, which we'll just select the color one. Enable some additional features for a 64-bit system. So we go back to processor type and features. And we want to add in support X2 APIC. And to device drivers, we need to set PCI support is already set. Go into that and ensure that message signal interrupts is set, which it already is. Back out and then down, which is quite low down to IO MMU hardware support is set and support for interrupts remapping which is down here um, for a 30 bit system there's an option there and oh it says here if the partition is an NVMe SSD um, you need to install it so I'll just double check that under device drivers NVMe support and NVMe Express, sorry, NVM Express block device is checked, what I set earlier on. Um, and there's a link there for BLFS index of kernel settings, so it lists all the options needed for BLFS packages. There's some information on the settings that have been set there, but while I'm here, I'm going to jump to the Grub page and set the settings in the kernel for EFI. So let's go back to this window and go into processor type and features again and ensure that EFI runtime service support is set. So that's some way down here. There it is there, service support and stub support. We don't want a deprecated feature and we don't need mixed mode support either. So I'll, I'll remove those. And we go back up to enable the block layer there, go into it. And we want to make sure under partition types, uh, which is that option there. We want advanced partition selection and we want to ensure, well, we've got PC BIOS partition tables and EFI GUID partition support. So they're already set, so that's good. Back up to device drivers and we need to go to firmware drivers, which is this option here. And set mark VGA VBE EFI frame buffer as generic system frame buffer. Back again and back down to the graphics support, which is just there. And we want to check that the DRM direct rendering manager is set. And inside that, we want to make sure that enable legacy FDEV support for your mode setting driver is set. It is simple frame buffer driver. which is somewhere down here. Uh, right, I'll remove that because we don't need that one. Simple, I must have missed it. Oh, it's within this, oh, oh no, that's right, direct rendering manager. DRM, yep. Enable legacy FDEV support and simple frame buffer. Oh, I must have missed it. Oh, there it is there, yeah. So I'll set that to on and then go back up one and Go to console display driver support and ensure that frame buffer console support is set. And it is. 
then need to go to file systems on the top menu and ensure that DOSFAT XFAT NT file systems is set and within that we need to get VFAT checked which it is and I might as well set these other ones up because uh, they can also be useful um, not sure about that one actually I'll leave that one for now Uh, yeah, the NTFS file system support could be useful. And we want to go to sudo file systems next and make sure that EFI variable file system is set. So it's as a module at the moment, but I'm going to build that in. And lastly, we go to native language support. Ensure that 437 is checked. I also set 850 because that's a European one. And I also check a few others here. Yeah, ASCII is already checked. And the A8591 is also checked as well, so that's good. And that one as well is another one I normally set. So they're all set. That's good. So that should be all we need for the kernel. So let's go back to the kernel page. And now we've got to make sure we set save this. So we'll exit, exit, exit. Make sure we save it, otherwise, we lose all those settings. And then we can start building the kernel with this make command. I'll time this, see how long it takes.
Okay, that's built in two and a half minutes. So that should work, but there's a couple of things that I should go back and double check because um, specifically I've got a USB keyboard and I didn't check that USB support was built in um, and the HID support. And the other thing is the network card. I need to check that that's actually installed, otherwise I won't be able to get to the outside world from the new system. So what I can use uh, with Gen 2, you get LSPCI by default, and that will show you what kernel modules are loaded. Um, if you put in minus K, I think it is. Oh, LSPCI. Sorry, this is on the LF, LFS system. So I need to change to this other tab. Uh, ls pci minus k um, and you can see it shows you what kernel drivers are in use and what modules have been loaded so for the networking i need to make sure that the driver e1000d is installed so what i'm going to do and this is why it's advantageous to keep the kernel sources lying around even after you've configured it and even after you've got a running kernel if you make, need to make any adjustments it's quite easy just to do make menu, config again, make adjustments and recompile and it will just recompile the bits it knows it needs to recompile based on the changes you've made. So I'll go back into device drivers, into network devices, which is there, and probably don't need that actually over the network. No, I don't need that. Don't need that either. Ethernet driver support. Uh, I'll basically get rid of all these drivers that I don't need. These are have been built in unnecessarily, so that's probably another 30 seconds of the compilation has been taken up building these unnecessarily. So it would have been better if I thought about this beforehand. It would have saved 30 seconds. Okay, not a great deal, but there's also the size of the kernel to think about as well. So Intel devices, this is an Intel device and it will be a PCI Express. So it's probably this driver here and there it is, E1000D. So that's the one I need to keep in so I can get rid of these other ones. They're not checked, so that's okay. I'll just remove the other manufacturer's devices. Oops. So a little bit tedious, but as I say, it helps in both compilation time. If you're on a less capable machine, it will make quite a bit of difference. Uh, but also, as I say, it's just a smaller kernel file. be less memory taken up. And it will load quicker. So that's that done. The other thing I need to check is um, USB. So I'm just going to remove these options here because I know I'm not going to be using those. Uh, don't need that. So input device support, mice and keyboards, AT keyboard, that's fine. Mice, yeah, it's a PS2 compatible mouse. So that should be okay. And I need to go to the USB bit next. Which is just further down here somewhere. There it is there. HID bus support. Get the battery level reporting could be useful. Special HID drivers. I can probably get rid of a lot of this. Um, they're actually, well, the old mouse that I was having trouble with initially was a wired mouse. That probably wouldn't matter so much, but the new one is a Logitech mouse, so I'll probably leave this in. Let's put these in here for what it's worth and just get rid of the rest. Again, just saving a little bit of space and compilation time. Especially helpful if you're trying to get a driver working, you've got to keep recompiling the 
kernel it could make a bit of a difference okay that should do and check that so that's the actual human interface just need to make sure that we've got some support for USB ports. Yes, USB 3. I don't think with USB 3 selected you need any other support. Um, I'll take that off. I won't be using USB. Mass storage could be useful for flash drives and so on. So yeah, that looks like that should be okay. It probably, probably would have worked as it was, but I've refined it a little bit. And as you can see, you could go and refine it even more. So I'll save that new configuration. I'll recompile. Um, and with the LSPCI, well, it's okay if I go back, there's probably other devices I should add in, um, such as this uh, engine management interface option to make best use of the system. If I did want to use Wi-Fi, then as you saw, I disabled that. So there's other things that you could glean from this set that in there even the audio controller which i haven't configured but it shows you what modules and what drivers are in use to get that working so that's quite useful to to know so yep i'll get this rebuilding like i say it'll rebuild only the bits it needs to rebuild or build the new bits and then integrate them so it won't take three and a half minutes this time it will be less time Okay, yes, yeah, so as you can see, it took a third of the time that time because there was less work to do. So let's now install any modules that we've generated. There's a few there. Um, if you decided to use a separate boot partition, yeah, issue this in the true environment. So we've already done that. So if we do df minus h, you can see we've mounted the boot and we've mounted EFI as well. Um, so next thing we do is to what we've done: make modules install, copy the kernel image into the boot directory, and the system.map file, and the actual configuration file. It's a good idea to keep as well. And we can install the documentation too. And it says this morning's here about um, creating a sim link, also about changing the ownership of the kernel directory. So let's do that now. Um, there's some more information there. Linux module load order. So if you need to configure that, you can do that there as it says. So now we're using Grub to set up the boot process. And we need to follow the Grub page on the BLFS page and skip all of this. So let's go there. 
So let's go back to the top again, make sure we don't miss anything. So turn off secure boot. Well, we should have already have turned that off because we needed that off to boot the flash drive. Um, so we've done that. We've done the kernel configuration. We can create an emergency boot disk if we wish, but or we can use the flash drive if used to boot, to boot um, as the host system. But that option's there if you wish to do that. So let's have a look. So create an emergency boot disk. Is this all to do with the boot disk? Yep. Find or create the EFI system partition. So we know what it is now. So it's saying now as the root user, create the mount point for the ESP and mount it. Replace SDA1 with the device nodes corresponding to the ESP. So it looks like we need to set some extra settings for the ESP. So I'm going to unmount it so that we mount it with the correct parameters. And that's unmounted because we've added it into the ETCFS tab. And it probably means that we're going to have to um, modify the ETCFS tab. So this is mount with make the VFAT dev SDA1 type O code page. Okay, so we need to copy this in but replace dev SDA1 with NVMe N1 P1. with these options and mount it at boot EFI. So the rest of that should work. Mounted on boot EFI. So if we do a DF minus H, we, could, we should see it's there again. If you want to mount the ESP automatically during system boot as a root you to add an entry for the ESP into a ETCFS tab. Well, I don't want it to mount automatically, but I want to retain the additional parameters. So I'm going to edit the FS tab so that we have those parameters that it's put in there. So that's the device. So mine is the NVMe 0 N1 P1. Yours may well be SDA1. Boot EFI is the correct location. It's a VFAT type file system. And I want to copy in these parameters here after the uh, no auto. So let's add that in there and then they've got the file system check order set to one so i'll also change that to one as well and that should be sufficient save that just check that again that looks okay yep so it does mean that it does mean that if i do anything with the efi boot partition Sorry, the EFI partition, I need to remember to mount it first. Minimal boot configuration of Grub and EFI. Okay. So to install Grub with the EFI application hard coded path, ensure the boot command. Okay, so we need to do this next. So Grub install. So this is a bit where we create the installation for Grub to make the system bootable. No errors reported, so that's good. So let's just have a quick look as it says there in boot. We've got our kernel files in EFI. We've got an EFI subdirectory and we've got a boot directory. And inside that we've got the boot x64 EFI. So that's what's just been installed. We now need to mount the EFI variable file system. If it's not already mounted which it won't be so let's put this in 
Oops, let's try and get all of that. So it says the SIS firmware EFI for VARS is not a mount point, but it's mounted it for us. And we can also add this to the um, FS tab as well. So I'm just going to edit that. And I'll add it in at the bottom. And I've done this manually just so I can format it to match the rest of the file. See if it had been copied in like that, it doesn't match the formatting. So that one's overspilled a little bit. That's not a problem. Save that. So I'll just double check that is set. It must be because I'm, I'm sure this computer can only boot in EF, uh, UEFI mode. So let's just look at that directory. And yeah, you can see the stuff in there. So we definitely have booted in UEFI. Setting up the configuration on UEFI based systems, Grub works by installing an EFI application, kind of special excuse for into the boot. So it's done that bit. Um, so as the root user, we've got to set up a boot entry in the EFI variables. So if we run EFI boot manager, it will display what there is to boot. And the only thing we've got at the moment is the USB stick. That's the only thing it knows about because that's what's been booted. So this command will add in another entry which will point at the um, Grub X64 EFI file that's just been installed and it will use that to boot the system. So that's worked. Now let's do EFI Boot Manager and you can see it's added in LFS into boot number zero. You see it didn't exist previously and it's picked out all the relevant information, the partition and so on and the file. So that should successfully boot. And as it says there, we've got the same output. It's identified that it's a 64-bit EFI platform and no errors reported. Um, and it, in fact, it says here to issue EFI boot manager with these extra commands. I'm not sure what they do. Perhaps they just cut out some of the rubbish to make it easier to read. Yes, it does. creating a grub configuration file so we need to do this so let's just copy this for now paste that in then we'll need to edit that so it's under boot grub grub.cfg and we'll need to set the root as um, SDA2 is 2, yeah, so this is the second partition, our root is the fourth partition, so that needs to be set to a 4, and we need to change this to the NVMe, so Let's quit that. And we want to put that bit in there. So that's the, oops, that's the root partition and uh, partition four. And one other thing I'll just check is the name of the kernel because this has changed sometimes. So it's worth checking. So I'll just insert that there just to make sure it's the same. 
BM Linners, 6, 10, 5, LFS 12.2. Now, one thing I've just remembered is that my kernel is in a separate partition. So what that means is I don't need to specify the boot directory here because it's actually at the root of a partition and I need to set the correct partition and that partition is partition number two so actually how it was was correct so partition one was the EFI partition partition two is the boot partition which is why I've specified it and which is why I've removed the boot because this file is on the root of that partition it only appears at boot because it gets mounted on boot so that means that the root, as far as Grub is concerned, is partition two, and the kernel to boot within that partition is on the root of that particular partition. And this bit here is telling it that the Linux system, the root file system, is on partition four. So that should be Assuming I've got the numbering correct, that should be all that's required to get the system up and running. If you're dual booting with Windows, there's another um, menu addition you can put in there into Grub Config. Um, and that's the end of the page for the Grub setup for EFI. So all we need to do is to move on to the end.